Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is Momotaro, or The Story of the Son of a Peach, as translated by Ye Theodora Ozaki. This story first appeared in Ozaki's Japanese Fairy Book, published in 1903. This story has elements of a fairy tale and elements of a sort of fantasy adventure. It's both interesting and wholesome. Now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Long, long ago, there lived an old man and an old woman. They were peasants and had to work hard to earn their daily rice. The old man used to go and cut grass for the farmers around, and while he was gone, the old woman, his wife, did the work of the house and worked in their own little rice field. One day, the old man went to the hills as usual to cut grass, and the old woman took some clothes to the river to wash. It was nearly summer, and the country was very beautiful to see in its fresh greenness as the two old people went on their way to work. The grass on the banks of the river looked like emerald velvet, and the pussy willows along the edge of the water were shaking out their soft tassels. The breezes blew and ruffled the smooth surface of the water into wavelets, and passing on touched the cheeks of the old couple, who, for some reason they could not explain, felt very happy that morning. The old woman at last found a nice spot by the river bank and put her basket down. Then she set to work to wash the clothes. She took them one by one out of the basket and washed them in the river and rubbed them on the stones. The water was as clear as crystal, and she could see the tiny fish swimming to and fro and the pebbles at the bottom. As she was busy washing her clothes, a great peach came bumping down the stream. The old woman looked up from her work and saw this large peach. She was sixty years of age, yet in all her life she had never seen such a big peach as this. How delicious that peach must be, she said to herself. I must certainly get it and take it home to my old man. She stretched out her arm to try and get it, but it was quite out of her reach. She looked about for a stick, but there was not one to be seen, and if she went to look for one, she would lose the peach. Stopping a moment to think what she would do, she remembered an old charm verse. Now she began to clap her hands to keep time to the rolling of the peach down the stream, and while she clapped, she sang this song. Distant water is bitter. The near water is sweet. Pass by the distant water and come into the sweet. Strange to say, as soon as she began to repeat this little song, the peach began to come nearer and nearer the bank where the old woman was standing, till at last it stopped just in front of her so that she was able to take it up in her hands. The old woman was delighted. She could not go on with her work, so happy and excited was she, so she put all the clothes back in her bamboo basket, and, with the basket on her back and the peach in her hand, she hurried homewards. It seemed a very long time to her to wait till her husband returned. The old man at last came back as the sun was setting, with a big bundle of grass on his back, so big that he was almost hidden and she could hardly see him. He seemed very tired and used the scythe for a walking stick, leaning on it as he walked along. As soon as the old woman saw him, she called out, Oh, fee son, I have been waiting for you to come home for such a long time today. What is the matter? Why are you so impatient? asked the old man, wondering at her unusual eagerness. Has anything happened while I have been away? Oh, no, answered the old woman. Nothing has happened, only I have found a nice present for you. That is good, said the old man. He then washed his feet in a basin of water and stepped up to the veranda. The old woman now ran into the little room and brought out from the cupboard the big peach. It felt even heavier than before. She held it up to him, saying, Just look at this! Did you ever see such a large peach in all your life? When the old man looked at the peach, he was greatly astonished and said, 
This is indeed the largest peach I have ever seen. Wherever did you buy it? I did not buy it, answered the old woman. I found it in the river where I was washing. And she told him the whole story. I am very glad that you have found it. Let us eat it now, for I am hungry, said Ophisan. He brought out the kitchen knife and, placing the peach on a board, was about to cut it when, wonderful to tell, the peach split in two of itself, and a clear voice said, Wait a bit, old man! And out stepped a beautiful little child. The old man and his wife were both so astonished at what they saw that they fell to the ground. The child spoke again, Do not be afraid. I am no demon or fairy. I will tell you the truth. Heaven has had compassion on you. Every day and every night you have lamented that you had no child. Your cry has been heard, and I am sent to be the son of your old age. On hearing this, the old man and his wife were very happy. They had cried night and day for sorrow at having no child to help them in their lonely old age, and now that their prayer was answered, they were so lost with joy that they didn't know where to put their hands or their feet. First the old man took the child up in his arms, and then the old woman did the same, and they named him Momotaro, or Son of a Peach, because he had come out of a peach. The years passed quickly by, and the child grew to be fifteen years of age. He was taller and far stronger than any of the other boys of his own age. He had a handsome face and a heart full of courage, and he was very wise for his years. The old couple's pleasure was very great when they looked at him, for he was just what they thought a hero ought to be like. One day, Momotaro came to his foster father and said solemnly, Father, by a strange chance we have become father and son. Your goodness to me has been higher than the mountain grasses which it was your daily work to cut, and deeper than the river where my mother washes the clothes. I do not know how to thank you enough. Why? answered the old man. It is a matter of course that a father should bring up his son. When you are older, it will be your turn to take care of us, so that after all there will be no profit or loss between us. All will be equal. Indeed, I'm rather surprised that you should thank me in this way. And the old man looked bothered. I hope you will be patient with me, said Momotaro. But before I begin to pay back your goodness to me, I have a request to make, which I hope you will grant me above everything else. I will let you do whatever you wish, for you are quite different to all other boys. Then let me go away at once. What do you say? Do you wish to leave your old father and mother and go away from your old home? I will surely come back again if you let me go now. Where are you going? You must think it strange that I want to go away, said Momotaro, because I have not yet told you my reason. Far away from here, to the northeast of Japan, there is an island in the sea. This island is the stronghold of a band of devils. I have often heard how they invade this land, kill and rob the people, and carry off all they can find. They are not only very wicked, but they are disloyal to our emperor and disobey his laws. They are also cannibals, for they kill and eat some of the poor people who are so unfortunate as to fall into their hands. These devils are very hateful beings. I must go and conquer them and bring back all the plunder of which they have robbed this land. It is for this reason that I want to go away for a short time. The old man was much surprised at hearing all of this from a mere boy of fifteen. He thought it best to let the boy go. He was strong and fearless, and besides all this, the old man knew he was no common child, for he had been sent to them as a gift from heaven, and he felt quite sure that the devils would be powerless to harm him. "'All you say is very interesting, Momotaro,' said the old man. "'I will not hinder you in your determination. You may go if you wish.' Go to the island as soon as ever you like, and destroy the demons and bring peace to the land. Thank you for all your kindness, said Momotaro, who began to get ready to go that very day. He was full of courage and did not know what fear was. 
The old man and woman at once set to work to pound rice in the kitchen mortar to make cakes for Momotaro to take with him on his journey. At last the cakes were made, and Momotaro was ready to start on his long journey. Parting is always sad, and so it was now. The eyes of the two old people were filled with tears, and their voices trembled as they said, Go, with all care and speed. We expect you back victorious. Momotaro was very sorry to leave his old parents, though he knew he was coming back as soon as he could, for he thought of how lonely they would be while he was away. But he said, Goodbye, quite bravely. I'm going now. Take good care of yourselves while I'm away. Goodbye. And he stepped quickly out of the house. In silence, the eyes of Momotaro and his parents met in farewell. Momotaro now hurried on his way till it was midday. He began to feel hungry, so he opened his bag and took out one of the rice cakes and sat down under a tree by the side of the road to eat it. While he was thus having his lunch, a dog almost as large as a colt came running out from the high grass. He made straight for Momotaro and, showing his teeth, said in a fierce way, "'You are a rude man to pass my field without asking permission first. If you leave me all the cakes you have in your bag, you may go.' Otherwise, I will bite you till I kill you. Momotaro only laughed scornfully. What is that you are saying? Do you know who I am? I am Momotaro, and am on my way to subdue the devils in their island stronghold in the northeast of Japan. If you try to stop me on my way there, I will cut you in two from the head downwards. The dog's manner at once changed. His tail dropped between his legs, and, coming near, he bowed so low that his forehead touched the ground. "'What do I hear? The name of Momotaro? Are you indeed Momotaro? I have often heard of your great strength. Not knowing who you were, I have behaved in a very stupid way. Will you please pardon my rudeness? Are you indeed on your way to invade the island of devils?' If you will take such a rude fellow with you as one of your followers, I shall be very grateful to you. I think I can take you with me if you wish to go, said Momotaro. Thank you, said the dog. By the way, I, I am very, very hungry. Will you give me one of the cakes you are carrying? This is the best kind of cake there is in Japan, said Momotaro. I cannot spare you a whole one. I will give you half of one. Thank you very much, said the dog, taking the piece thrown to him. Then Momotaro got up, and the dog followed. For a long time they walked over the hills and through the valleys. As they were going along, an animal came down from a tree a little ahead of them. The creature soon came up to Momotaro and said, Good morning, Momotaro. You are welcome in this part of the country. Will you allow me to go with you? The dog answered jealously, Momotaro already has a dog to accompany him. Of what use is a monkey like you in battle? We are on our way to fight the devils. Go away. The dog and the monkey began to quarrel and bite, for these two animals always hate each other. Now don't quarrel, said Momotaro, putting himself between them. Wait a moment, dog. It is not at all dignified for you to have such a creature as that following you, said the dog. "'What do you know about it?' asked Momotaro, and, pushing aside the dog, he spoke to the monkey. "'Who are you?' "'I am a monkey living in these hills,' replied the monkey. "'I heard of your expedition to the Island of Devils, and I have come to go with you. Nothing will please me more than to follow you.' "'Do you really wish to go to the Island of Devils and fight with me?' "'Yes, sir,' replied the monkey.' I admire your courage, said Momotaro. Here is a piece of one of my fine rice cakes. Come along. So the monkey joined Momotaro. The dog and the monkey did not get on well together. They were always snapping at each other as they went along and always wanting to have a fight. This made Momotaro very cross, and at last he sent the dog on ahead with a flag and put the monkey behind with a sword, and he placed himself between them with a war fan, which is made of iron. By and by they came to a large field. Here a bird flew down and alighted on the ground just in front of the little party. 
It was the most beautiful bird Momotaro had ever seen. On its body were five different robes of feathers, and its head was covered with a scarlet cap. The dog at once ran at the bird and tried to seize and kill it, but the bird struck out its spurs and flew at the dog's tail, and the fight went hard with both. Momotaro, as he looked on, could not help admiring the bird. It showed so much spirit in the fight. It would certainly make a good fighter. Momotaro went up to the two combatants and, holding the dog back, said to the bird, "'You rascal! You are hindering my journey. Surrender at once, and I will take you with me. If you don't, I will set this dog to bite your head off.' The bird surrendered at once and begged to be taken into Momotaro's company. "'I do not know what excuse to offer for quarreling with the dog, your servant, but I did not see you. I am a miserable bird called a pheasant. It is very generous of you to pardon my rudeness and to take me with you. Please allow me to follow you and the dog and the monkey.' "'I congratulate you on surrendering so soon,' said Momotaro, smiling. "'Come and join us in our raid on the devils.' "'Are you going to take this bird with you also?' asked the dog, interrupting. "'Why do you ask such unnecessary questions? Didn't you hear what I said? I take the bird because I wish to.' "'Hum,' said the dog. Then Momotaro stood and gave this order. "'Now, all of you must listen to me. The first thing necessary in an army is harmony.' It is a wise saying which says that advantage on earth is better than advantage in heaven. Union amongst ourselves is better than any earthly gain. When we are not at peace amongst ourselves, it is no easy thing to subdue an enemy. From now, you three, the dog, the monkey, and the pheasant, must be friends with one mind. The first who begins a quarrel will be discharged on the spot. All the three promised not to quarrel. The pheasant was now made a member of Momotaro's suite and received half a cake. Momotaro's influence was so great that the three became good friends and hurried onwards with him as their leader. Hurrying on day after day, they came out at last upon the shore of the northeastern sea. There was nothing to be seen as far as the horizon, not a sign of any island. All that broke the stillness was the rolling of the waves upon the shore. Now, The dog and the monkey and the pheasant had come very bravely all the way through the long valleys and over the hills, but they had never seen the sea before, and for the first time since they set out, they were bewildered and gazed at each other in silence. How were they to cross the water and get to the island of devils? Momotaro soon saw that they were daunted by the sight of the sea, and to try them he spoke loudly and roughly, "'Why do you hesitate? Are you afraid of the sea?' Oh, what cowards you are! It is impossible to take such weak creatures as you with me to fight the demons. It will be far better for me to go alone. I discharge you all at once. The three animals were taken aback at this sharp reproof and clung to Momotaro's sleeve, begging him not to send them away. Please, Momotaro, said the dog. We have come this far, said the monkey. It is inhuman to leave us here, said the pheasant. We're not at all afraid of the sea, said the monkey again. Please do take us with you, said the pheasant. Do, please, said the dog. They had now gained a little courage, so Momotaro said, Well then, I will take you with me, but be careful. Momotaro now got a small ship, and they all got on board. The wind and weather were fair, and the ship went like an arrow over the sea. It was the first time they had ever been on the water, and so at first the dog, the monkey, and the pheasant were frightened at the waves and the rolling of the vessel, but by degrees they grew accustomed to the water and were quite happy again. Every day they paced the deck of their little ship, eagerly looking out for the demon's island. When they grew tired of this, they told each other stories of all their exploits of which they were proud, and then played games together and Momotaro found much to amuse him in listening to the three animals and watching their antics, and in this way he forgot that the way was long and that he was tired of the voyage and of doing nothing. He longed to be at work killing the monsters who had done so much harm in his country. 
As the wind blew in their favor and they met no storms, the ship made a quick voyage, and one day, when the sun was shining brightly, a sight of land rewarded the four watchers at the bow. Momotaro knew at once that what they saw was the devil's stronghold. On the top of the precipitous shore, looking out to sea, was a large castle. Now that his enterprise was close at hand, he was deep in thought, with his head leaning on his hands, wondering how he should begin the attack. His three followers watched him, waiting for orders. At last he called to the pheasant, "'It is a great advantage for us to have you with us,' said Momotaro to the bird. "'For you have good wings. Fly at once to the castle and engage the demons to fight. We will follow you.' The pheasant at once obeyed. He flew off from the ship, beating the air gladly with his wings. The bird soon reached the island and took up his position on the roof in the middle of the castle, calling out loudly, "'All you devils listen to me! The great Japanese General Momotaro has come to fight you and to take your stronghold from you. If you wish to save your lives, surrender at once, and in token of your submission, you must break off the horns that grow on your forehead. If you do not surrender at once, but make up your mind to fight, we, the pheasant,' The dog and the monkey will kill you all by biting and tearing you to death. The horned demons, looking up and only seeing a pheasant, laughed and said, a Wild pheasant indeed! It is ridiculous to hear such words from a mean thing like you. Wait till you get a blow from one of our iron bars. Very angry indeed were the devils. They shook their horns and their shocks of red hair fiercely and rushed to put on tiger-skin trousers to make themselves look more terrible. They then brought out great iron bars and ran to where the pheasant perched over their heads and tried to knock him down. The pheasant flew to one side to escape the blow and then attacked the head of first one and then another demon. He flew round and round them, beating the air with his wings so fiercely and ceaselessly that the devils began to wonder whether they had to fight one or many more birds. In the meantime, Momotaro had brought his ship to land. As they had approached, he saw that the shore was like a precipice and that the large castle was surrounded by high walls and large iron gates and was strongly fortified. Momotaro landed and, with the hope of finding some entrance, walked up the path toward the top, followed by the monkey and the dog. They soon came upon two beautiful damsels washing clothes in a stream. Momotaro saw that the clothes were blood-stained, and that, as the two maidens washed, their tears were falling fast down their cheeks. He stopped and spoke to them, "'Who are you, and why do you weep?' We are captives of the demon king. We were carried away from our homes to this island, and though we are the daughters of daimios, we are obliged to be his servants, and one day he will kill us, and the maidens held up the blood-stained clothes, and eat us, and there is no one to help us. And their tears burst out afresh at this horrible thought. I will rescue you, said Momotaro. Do not weep any more. Only show me how I may get into the castle. Then the two ladies led the way and showed Momotaro a little back door in the lowest part of the castle wall, so small that Momotaro could hardly crawl in. The pheasant, who was all this time fighting hard, saw Momotaro and his little band rush in at the back. Momotaro's onslaught was so furious that the devils could not stand against him. At first their foe had been a single bird, the pheasant, but now that Momotaro and the dog and the monkey had arrived, they were bewildered, for the four enemies fought like a hundred, so strong were they. Some of the devils fell off the parapet of the castle and were dashed to pieces on the rocks beneath. Others fell into the sea and were drowned, and many were beaten to death by the three animals. The chief of the devils at last was the only one left. He made up his mind to surrender, for he knew that his enemy was stronger than mortal man. He came up humbly to Momotaro and threw down his iron bar, and, kneeling down at the victor's feet, he broke off the horns on his head in token of submission, for they were the signs of his strength and power. "'I am afraid of you,' he said meekly. "'I cannot stand against you. I will give you all the treasure hidden in this castle if you will spare my life.' Momotaro laughed. 
It's not like you, big devil, to beg for mercy, is it? I cannot spare your wicked life, however much you beg, for you have killed and tortured many people and robbed our country for many years. Then Momotaro tied the devil chief up and gave him into the monkey's charge. Having done this, he went into all the rooms of the castle and set the prisoners free and gathered together all the treasure he found. The dog and the pheasant carried home the plunder, and thus Momotaro returned triumphantly to his home, taking with him the devil chief as a captive. The two poor damsels, daughters of Daimios, and others whom the wicked demon had carried off to be his slaves, were taken safely to their own homes and delivered to their parents. The whole country made a hero of Momotaro on his triumphant return, and rejoiced that the country was now free from the robber devils who had been a terror of the land for a long time. The old couple's joy was greater than ever, and the treasure Momotaro had brought home with him enabled them to live in peace and plenty to the end of their days. Momotaro-san, Momotaro-san, the best sentence in this story is, The breezes blew and ruffled the smooth surface of the water into wavelets, and, passing on, touched the cheeks of the old couple, who, for some reason they could not explain, felt very happy that morning. The old couple in this story is so nice and sweet and so kind to each other, she sees the peach and she immediately wants to bring it home to her husband. Aren't they lovely? I think it's fascinating that the bulk of this story is devoted to demonstrating what a great general Momotaro is. In that sense, it's not really an adventure. The actual fighting is just a paragraph, while the way that he recruits and organizes and manages his troops is several pages long. Which actually brings me to the origins of this story. This is an ancient story dating back to probably the 1300s in Japan, although it was first written down in the early 1600s. The bones of the story, in which a boy is born from a peach, goes on a journey to fight the devils or the ogres or whatever, recruits three animals along the way, and returns victorious, are consistent all the way back to the very beginning. But the story has evolved in really interesting ways over time. For a couple of centuries in the Edo period, Momotaro wasn't actually born from a peach. Instead, the old woman found the magical peach, and the couple ate it, and they became rejuvenated, and they had their son naturally from their newly youthful bodies. However, by the end of that period, the story had reverted back to the boy being magically born from inside a peach. One of the most fascinating evolutions of the story are changes to Momotaro himself. He became younger over time. In the earliest versions of the story, he was in his 30s, but by the mid-1800s, he was all the way down to being 15 years old. And this is because of the evolutions of his character. In the early versions of the story, he was the lazy hero prototype. He was big and he was strong, but he just laid around all the time and he didn't do anything. As the story evolved, he became younger and he became more proactive. And I don't know if this is the cause of or the result of this figure transforming to be more of an example for young people. The story started to be used to tell young people how to be kind, bold, wise, and loyal to your parents. In time, this led to Momotaro being used as a symbol to instill patriotism and a kind of martial spirit. In the 1900s, he began to figure significantly in Japan's wartime propaganda. After World War II, of course, the story stopped being used in textbooks, and the role of the character in modern Japanese society is still evolving. Which brings me to this version of the story. Ozaki's translation is probably based on the Meiji-era version by Sazanami Iwaya, who collected and republished Japanese folktales and popularized the story of Momotaro in the late 1800s, 1890. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. This week's confession is that although I do try to do stories that are a bit obscure and unknown, I absolutely love it when a story is famous enough that it has all these fantastic illustrations. These images are just beautiful, and they're in the public domain, and I'm so happy that I get to use them. But... In some of them, the animals are depicted standing up and wearing clothes, and for some reason that just really surprised me. 
Apparently, I'm very comfortable imagining talking animals, but I never imagine them walking on their hind legs and wearing clothes and carrying swords and riding horses and all the other things they do in some of these depictions. Maybe my imagination was just too strongly shaped by the Narnia books? Actually, no, because Reepicheep the mouse stands on his hind legs and he carries a sword. By the way, I'm sure it's too referential to the Puss in Boots character, but I really did want Reepicheep to be voiced by Antonio Banderas in the movies. Wouldn't that have been perfect? Anyway, <laughs> if you've made it this far in the video, go ahead and click subscribe, and then click everything else to help other people discover it. At Restored Lore, I find old, odd, and obscure stories, and I share them with you every week, and you would not want to miss anything. Cheers. I'll see you next week.